My job is not only to make airplanes more efficient, but that's a secondary job, is to make them fly higher, faster, and longer, which is kind of a cool job. This is my lab. I get paid to do this. That's 20 megawatts. Uh, that's enough to power 20,000 houses, that's average houses, 20 megawatts right there. Um, of course, to make airplanes fly higher, faster, and longer, we got to use a lot of energy to keep them up there, which is a lot of fun. But uh, it also makes the Department of Defense the single largest user of energy in the world. Um, so many of you might not look at us as heroes, but as the villains, right? If you worry about global warming, fuel consumption, why is your gas so expensive? We're the single biggest cause of all that. <laughs> so where do we get our energy from? How can we make these airplanes fly higher, faster, and longer and not spend a fortune on fuel? Well, this is a, a plot here of uh, each of these symbols is 1% of where our energy comes from, and about 60% of it comes from petroleum, uh, natural gas, and oil, of course. 20% of it comes from coal, so that 80% there is, is dead dinosaurs. Uh, and it turns out that even though we're the single biggest user of uh, fuel in the world, and the Air Force spends, buys uh, 2.5 billion gallons, think of that bill, 2.5 billion gallons of, of jet fuel, um, we're really only 1% of the problem. Um, so when I'm asked to make airplanes fly higher, faster, and longer, and more efficiently, even if I did it my perfect job, I wouldn't affect this other 99% of the problem. Um, so there are alternatives to how we can power things. One of them is biofuels. This happens to be a biofuel-powered system here. We're studying in the lab with the help of uh, my daughter and a school project, perhaps. <laughs> um, so this is a gerbil, and he's, he's driving a uh, bio-powered genset. Uh, so he's making about a third of a watt lighting up a light bulb by running on his little wheel. He seemed to enjoy it. Uh, we put a gearbox in there, spun a generator, lit up the light bulb. Um, so in the process of doing this, we, we studied it and not only got an A on our science project, but we also quantified how much power a gerbil can make. And it was about a third of a watt. <laughs> we defined this as a standard gerbil power. Um, I haven't seen it in a whole lot of Air Force briefings yet, but I'm sure it'll take over, because it's a much more uh, precise measure of power than a regular horsepower, right? Uh, there's about 2,000-some gerbils in a horsepower, so if, if we're talking gerbil power, we're really precise. We're measuring things very accurately. <laughs> so if we get a lot of gerbils together, um, we can power a car or an airplane. It takes about a, a quarter million gerbils, which is a lot of gerbil food. <laughs> to power a car or a small UAV. Uh, and then, of course, you get to do what, what I get to do and you want to make uh, 20 megawatts, you need like 60 million gerbils. <laughs> so that's a lot of gerbils. Uh, it's a lot of gerbil food and a lot of gerbil poop. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a problem about biofuels. And the other problem is if we took all the, or all the agricultural production in the United States uh, today and we switched that all over to fuel production, we'd offset 7% of our energy needs, uh, which is great. We'd have no food to eat. So that, that's probably not a good solution. So we started looking at, are there other ways to get energy, other places other than dead dinosaurs and food and gerbils? Um, so we came up with three things. Fusion, we're, we're not quite smart enough, my group anyway is not quite smart enough to solve that one uh, today, um, maybe next year. Uh, there's a tap into a mega volcano, and, and that's hopefully my talk next year, but there, there's some risk associated with tapping into a mega volcano. And the last one, we actually stole this from somebody else. It's, let's just steal the energy in the moon. So let's steal the power of the moon. And it turns out there's 126 billion million gerbil power in the moon. That's enough so every one of us can run one of these jet engines all day, every day in the world. All, however many billion people there are, like seven or eight billion people, we could all have two of these. And we still wouldn't take away the energy in the moon. So my plan is to steal the power of the moon, um, tap in the mega volcano, and solve fusion. So, of course, I mentioned earlier that we didn't come up with this plan all by ourselves. Uh, there's a well-known documentary. If you haven't seen it, I'm, I'm pretty sure your kids have. You might ask them about it afterwards. Um, this documentary chron chronicles some of the problems associated the first time they tried to steal the moon. Uh, and, of course, they had a plan and, and all that. Um, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, when you get into energy, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So you get super villains and villains involved and things like that. So in looking at how to steal the moon's energy, uh, we had to come up with a, a revision to the plan. Um, so the first step we added to the plan was step zero, get you to help me. So if we're going to steal the moon, uh, I need you all on board to help me. And so if you're not an evil genius, 
Uh, that's all right, we need minions as well. <laughs> so stealing the moon is a, a super rug mega engineering project. Uh, so it, it'd be probably worth looking at some previous projects like this. So the two probably most famous are the Manhattan Project and the Apollo Project. And these were very costly programs that tr accomplished uh, incredible things. But these projects, uh, they produced some, some benefits, like the Manhattan Project saved us from having to invade Japan and probably saved a lot of lives in, in some senses. It also ushered in the nuclear age, right? We got nuclear power, nuclear medicine, um, computer modeling, things like that. Apollo Project also had returns on investment. The space age, uh, small computers, um, uh, telecommunication, satellite TV, uh, your, your phone is based on technology that came out of the Apollo Project. So a lot of things came out of that. So when we think about mega engineering projects, we got to look at the return on investment. And certainly the Apollo Project and the Manhattan Project, it's hard to quantify what were the returns on investment because it's taken a lot of decades for us to see all the things that were accomplished from those. Uh, but here's a project that was easy to quantify the return on investment, and that's the Grand Coulee Dam. I'm sure we've all heard of the Hoover Dam, but this was the uh, single biggest return on investment from the, the uh, big works projects. The Grand Coulee Dam cost a billion dollars in today's dollars to construct. So that's a lot of money, a billion dollars. Um, however, it makes two billion in power every year, and it has ever since it's been constructed. So that pays for itself every six months. So enormous investment, took a lot of time, a lot of resources, but it pays for itself every six months, and energy from that is extremely cheap and affordable now. So that's one example of mega engineering. The biggest mega engineering project at all, of all time, uh, and one you probably use all the time, is the National Highway System. And this was actually put together um, during the Eisenhower administration so we could shuttle tanks and military supplies all over really quickly and easily. And it cost over $400 billion and a lot of time to put it together. However, it moves in two weeks, it moves over $400 billion of goods. So its return on investment is absolutely enormous and transformational. And if you have to commute long distances, you really appreciate that investment. So those are uh, examples of mega engineering projects. So how are we going to steal the moon, and in particular the energy from the moon? Well, it turns out that the moon has lots of energy. Um, and it's so much energy that we could take and power all of human civilization for 42 million years before the moon would uh, do anything significant. So it's a big source of energy, and we don't have to worry about gobbling it up uh, like we do with dead dinosaurs. Uh, but we're going to use the lunar tides. It turns out the moon energy uh, sloshes water around. And it really, you can think of it as the moon in an oval of water. Or not the moon, the Earth in the oval of water. And it's a distorted oval. And the Earth spins around there. Uh, and you know, as you pass through the low spot, the tide is low. When you pass through the high spot, the tide is high. And uh, that's great, but it, it only happens once per day, or twice per day, because there's two high spots. And it's not very high, right? It goes up about three feet, down about three feet. And that's, there's some energy in that, but it's hard to put a conventional hydroelectric plant on three feet of water. You need a whole lot of water to do that. And it only happens twice a day, so the power density is just not there. It'd be an outrageously expensive project to do that. So this, this kid here, I, I uh, conjured up a, an assistant to demonstrate. This is just like the moon. It goes around really slowly. He's trying to swing. His legs are moving really slow. Not much is happening. He's really bored. So let's have him go faster. If we could get the, the Earth to spin faster, uh, we could see the tides go in and out faster. But uh, like this kid, he wouldn't get too far. Um, so you can see he's pumping really hard now. And it's a lot more exciting, but he's not moving at all. So this next part of the technology, we weren't sure would get cleared for public release, but then it turned out that this kid uh, stole the idea and spread it amongst all his friends. And uh, so these markings are somewhat obsolete. And that is his tiny little push of his legs swinging back and forth, or you pushing on their back. If you time it right and learn how to time that right, you can achieve what's called resonance. So everybody should have had on their chair if they didn't lose it yet. An elastic string with a washer. There were a lot of knots involved in putting these all together. So if you take out your elastic string and washer, if you haven't shot your neighbor with it yet, uh, please be careful with this. Um, so the idea here is the ocean doesn't move very far. So if I move my fingers up and down one inch, up, down, one inch, down one inch, the washer moves up and down one inch. Real exciting, yeah? You guys asleep in the back? OK, now if I move my fingers up and down one inch really fast, and you do a good job of it, the washer doesn't really move at all. If you did a really good job, it doesn't move. All right, so too slow, not very exciting. Too fast, not very exciting. Now, if I do it right, and I time my one-inch swings just right, you can hit your neighbor in the eye and <laughs> do all sorts of things. So that's resonance. If you're really good, you can get it to jump like two feet, fly all over the place. 
So that's resonance. So we take, oh, I can hear people having fun with that. <laughs> All right, you can put your strings down, save them later, show your neighbors. So this is how we're going to seal the moon. We're going to lasso it, <laughs> whatever. Um, so the idea here, though, is the moon is an infinite push that doesn't move very far. And if we can capture that energy and make a system resonate, we can do spectacular stuff. So we built a scale model of the ocean. Ours is like this big. And uh, we don't wait 24 hours for it to move. Uh, we, we make it move a lot faster than that with an electric motor. So this is our model of the ocean. And uh, the scale on the left is uh, inches. And so we're moving the ocean up and down about an inch. And uh, you can see the column of water moves up and down about an inch. So you can do the same resonant phenomena with a, a spring, a kid on a swing, and also with sloshing water. Um, so that's slower than resonant. If I go faster than resonant, uh, you can see our model of the ocean's got a little beach ball bobbing up and down there. And we're moving up and down an inch still, but we're moving faster than resonant. And the water column is moving about a half an inch, the water column on the left. Um, so that's not terribly exciting either. But if I move it resonantly, so we're still moving up and down an inch, and I have a tuned pipe that's set just to the frequency we happen to be moving the ocean up and down at. Um, you can see that column of water is starting to really start to move up and down. So I'm exciting it with one inch of excitation, and I'm actually pumping water up and down seven inches. Um, so that's kind of cool, right? I've amplified the push of that one inch motion up, so now it's seven inches. So now all I have to do is put a catch basin up there, skim off the water when it's seven inches high, run it through a conventional hydroelectric plant, and we're golden, right? Now, don't put out, get out your thing yet, but there's, there's some issues with this, and that is scaling, right? Seven inches is, is not very exciting. Just as in, if I hold my washer like this and try to get it to resonate, it's not very exciting, right? Similarly, if I wait for the moon to swing the washer up and down, it doesn't move very much, right? I can wait 24 hours, and if I was really precise in my measurements, maybe I'd see it move a little bit, but the washer would have to weigh a whole heck of a lot in order to actually be excited by the moon, and it would only move every 24 hours. Well, luckily, there's something really heavy and cheap and plentiful, and that's salt water. So we can take salt water and get it to uh, slosh around and push by the moon. So this is a, a pretty big project. In fact, uh, the scaling rules say that the bigger we go, the better it works. Um, if we make it small, it doesn't get excited very much. So we have to go really big, and it isn't until we start thinking about powering the entirety of the United States that it really starts to make sense, that we can pump water up and down a significant amount and make it easy to put in a conventional hydroelectric plant. And so the size of the system to power all of North America happens to be about the same size as the state of Ohio, which I think we can all relate to, especially if we've been on the interstate. Um, so it's, it's a crazy project, right, to think um, we'd, we'd build something big enough to occupy the state of Ohio. I don't recommend doing it in Ohio. Um, and the other part of this is we'd have to put in a hydroelectric plant, and the hydroelectric plant to power all of North America is roughly $500 billion. So it turns out, you know, the state of Ohio is not probably the place to do it, to get excited by the ocean, but there's two naturally occurring places that you could do this. The Bay of Fundy up in the northeast uh, near Maine and Canada, and then the Bay of California down in the southwest. Uh, and so the Bay of Fundy, they're having big environmental protests right now about extracting a megawatt of tidal power, so it's probably not a good place to go to do this because we want to extract it like a terawatt. Um, and there's only enough energy in the Bay of Fundy probably to power half of North America, but the Bay of California has more than enough energy to power all of North America. Um, and if we gave everybody who lived in the Bay of California 10 years' salary to move, uh, it would cost about $6 billion. So it, it's well within the possibility to think we could have the Bay of California purchase, right? <laughs> Um, so if we did that, we bought the Bay of California, um, we'd have to build a, a tuned pipe into that bay and get it to resonate with the ocean. And that, that tuned pipe would take about a billion cubic yards of concrete. So that's a lot of cement trucks. It's good job security for the cement, cement workers and whatnot. That's a lot of concrete. And there'd probably be environmental protests and things like that. So the other option would be, let's just do the continental shelf. And so if you look everywhere, it's light blue off the coast of the United States. The water is on average about 150 feet deep, which happens to be about the size you need to make one of these systems. And so we could put in these spiral-shaped systems that look like that system I showed in Ohio. We'd probably need uh, two or three to power all the United States, but I'm sure we'd start gobbling up more energy as we thought of things to do with it. So I'd imagine we'd scatter them around the United States to power all of North America. Uh, so these are pretty big systems. You'd be able to see them from space. And the cool thing about this is it actually takes less concrete than it does to do it in the Bay of California. It only takes about a half 
a billion cubic meters of concrete, or fill. And so that still sounds somewhat ludicrous. I'm, I'm proposing here a $500 billion project and 500 million cubic feet of concrete, or fill, to build a system like this. Well, it turns out systems of this scale have been done before. If you look at the Dubai waterfront, which was done so you could see a, a map of the Earth from space and some other uh, pretty shapes from space, they moved a billion cubic yards of fill. And they spent about $26 billion to do it. So it's within the scope of a $500 billion project to move this kind of a mass. So here's the really cool thing. I'm proposing now a project that's on the order of $525 billion to power all of North America. However, it generates $500 billion in power each and every year. Um, and so the return on investment is absolutely enormous, right? The first year, it cost us a lot to get that power. But in the 50th year, we're talking about penny per kilowatt hour. So anybody who's paid their power bill, whether you think global warming is, is a problem or not, certainly the people in Greenland are still rooting for it, um, a penny per kilowatt hour for power, uh, that's just going to completely revolutionize the way we think of power. And so my job is to make airplanes fly higher, faster, and longer. Um, we currently do that using about 1% of our energy resources. So I can look at this problem as how do I fix that 1% and make it better and more efficient, as Isaac said. Um, and the other way I can flip, about, flip the problem is think about the other 99% of our energy. What if I can make the 99% of the energy powered by something that was essentially free, the moon? Steal the energy of the moon, solve some of these other problems, solve my 99% of the energy problem, then jet fuel will be really cheap at that point, and I've solved my 1% of the problem. So a lot of times it's about perspective. Um, you're working on a little part of a problem, and you need to step back and think, why is this a problem? How can I solve this? Can I make this problem completely go away so that jet fuel doesn't cost $10 a gallon and I can use as much as I want in my lab? Um, so <laughs> thank you very much.